No, I have to say, hand on heart, I didn't see it when it was broadcast because I'm not really a GB News aficionado. I don't really watch it. Occasionally I pick it up uh, simply to make fun of Jacob Rees-Mogg. And I'm surprised, actually, he seems to be the best thing on there. But there was an interview conducted by Esther McVeigh and Philip Davis, who are married, with the Chancellor, uh, Jeremy Hunt. I had to pause for a moment there and try and remember what the name of the Chancellor actually was. Um, many people have had that problem. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who has given Spoonerism an entirely new lease of life. And so he gave a budget on the 11th of March, the spring budget, and Esther McVeigh, a sitting MP, a sitting Conservative MP, and her husband interviewed him. Now, that interview was then used by the Chancellor of the Exchequer on social media to promote the ideas in the budget. It seems extraordinarily narcissistic and nepotistic. Is it right? I think probably not. John Nicholson has put out a tweet. How come Tory MPs are interviewing the Tory Chancellor on GB News? Ofcom rules are clear. MPs may not present the news or conduct political interviews. I challenge the Ofcom boss today in the Culture Select Committee. Are you satisfied with the answer? Well, I did see that, and it did seem extraordinary. Uh, the Ofcom boss is a lady called Melanie Dawes, and she looked um, she looked completely surprised at um, John Nicholson's question and uh, didn't seem to have done her homework at all, doesn't seem to really know very much about GB News. Well, GB News is a lame British attempt um, to imitate Fox News. It's gone very right-wing, very quickly. It was set up by... Oh, who was it set up by? Anyway, whoever it was set up um, uh, uh, stayed with it for a very short space of time. Andrew Neil and then ran off. Um, probably he was he was embarrassed. It was a sort of Frankenstein moment. He was embarrassed that he'd created a monster. Um, and Andrew Neil was so scrupulous when he was on the BBC to make sure that he looked objective. So scrupulous that even Boris was terrified of appearing uh, with Andrew Neil, though Andrew Neil was clearly on the right, clearly a Brexiteer, um, and clearly uh, somebody who would approve of Boris. Well, I mean, would anybody approve of Boris? I don't know. There is a suggestion that Boris is part of a thing called post-truth politics. This is an American idea, uh, drummed up really because of the experience of Trump, that um, we've got to a point where we accept that all politicians lie and they just get away with it. I can't believe... I don't care. Um, Boris does seem to have a great deal in common with um, President Trump, but I think one has to go back and one has to realise that despite the fact that Boris seems to be a new breed of deceiver in Parliament, there have been others before. Uh, the, dossier, uh, the dodgy dossier produced by Alistair Campbell uh, strongly suggests that Tony Blair was not being honest when he took our country into war with Iraq, that there really weren't um, weapons of mass destruction and that everybody knew it. Uh, I think it may, it may come, it may be very difficult and it may take many years before history finally records the fact that uh, there was evidence that everybody in the cabinet knew there were not weapons of mass destruction. That will be the smoking gun, but I don't imagine that's going to be available to anybody at this stage. But the idea that we can be peddling disinformation, the idea that we can be peddling fake news, the idea that politicians can be lying to our face, when at some point in, a, in an emergency they've got to stand up as they did during COVID and they've got to tell us to believe them. Why are we surprised by the huge burst in people who deny the vaccine, who deny the existence of COVID? Why should they believe, why should they trust politicians who they know have been lying to them? Why should uh, people believe 
um, politicians when they tell them that Brexit is good or bad for them. This, th th there has to come a point where the desperation for power and the willingness to lie, this Machiavellian obsession uh, that is worn on the sleeve of people like Boris, backfires and destroys the very uh, business that they are in, the business of politics. Politics is about trading uh, differing views and yet having a cup of tea at the same time. That's what politics is. Politics is about civilised exchange of different views. But Boris thinks it's about winning the game. Boris thinks it's a game and it doesn't matter how much you lie to seize your objective. Now, um, the, the sort of cheating that is going on uh, with the Esther McVeigh thing, with the Melanie Dawes thing, indeed with the chairman of the BBC thing, all of these people are in very shaky positions because they're all uh, on the knife edge of disobeying the rules. And I'm sure Ofcom will come out and say, well, GB News is perfectly OK. Because Ofcom toad is to what the system wants. Just as in the same way when uh, I write to the Secretary of State for Digital Media, Culture and Sport and Julia Lopez writes back to me and says, oh, what you need to do is talk to Ofcom. Ofcom can change the rules and Ofcom will tell me, no, they can't. They're, in the, they're, they're part of this vicious circle. They're part of this absurd game. And I'm the patsy who has to be put down. So is Boris lying? Of course he is. Is he a chancer? Of course he is. We know he's lying because he lied when he stood on the steps of his house and said he wasn't having an affair with, was it Petronola Wyatt, the person from The Spectator? Uh, he was lying when he was sacked from the Times for inventing a quotation. So we know he's a liar. We know he's a liar. And did the Commons know that he was a liar? Did the Conservatives know that he was a liar? Well, yes, probably they did. They would be rather stupid if they didn't. But he is charismatic. He wins elections. He is charming, easygoing, bright, funny, uh, intelligent, utterly soulless and ruthless. He sees what he wants and he rides roughshod over everything and everyone to get it. That's what makes him a winner. That's what makes him a force of energy. And that's what makes him a liability. Voters don't care if he lies because everybody lies. Yes, and that cheapens our politics. And that's where we've got to. So nobody believes anything. We're in a sad, sorry state if that is how it's going to remain. We have to clean up our politics. It's not a matter of getting rid of Boris. It's a matter of cleaning up the entire business. It's a matter of cleaning the ship. And for that, we don't want to be left with the bland and the boring. We want the character, we want the charm, we want the energy, but we want to trust as well. I fear, I fear the rot set in during Brexit. But I fear the example of what was going on in America was too much to resist. And at the moment, we need to look to try and find some sort of beacon of hope and stability. I don't know whether that is Keir Starmer, I don't know whether that is Rishi Sunak, but we can't wait. Um, <laughs> we can't wait for Keir Starmer um, for two years in the hope that it will then get better after that. That will be too late. We need to invest our hope in Rishi Sunak. 
because he is the only hope available. And we need to also invest our hope in those who surround Sunak, not only the people in his cabinet, but the people in other parties who are leading their other parties in Westminster, the leaders of the SDP, the Greens, the Liberal Party, and the leader of the opposition. If these people can be seen as beacons of truth and honesty and uprightness, if we can start to trust them, then maybe we can turn the tide on this post-truth politics.